I'm Mel. I'm Tiff. And we're On Pump, with a podcast that takes you inside the beating heart of modern medicine and explores the fascinating world of perfusion, the science that keeps the blood flowing during life-saving surgeries. We are the ultimate destination for all things perfusion. On this show, we'll be exploring the latest developments and advancements in perfusion technology, providing insights into day-to-day life of perfusionists, interviewing top professionals in the field, and giving you the tools you need to stay ahead of the curve in the ever-evolving world of healthcare. So sit back, relax, and get ready to pump up your knowledge with the most cutting-edge information and discussions in the field. You are listening to On Pump, where we keep the blood flowing and the minds engaged. Mel, how about you help us officially kick off this podcast series by telling us a little about yourself and your background? Yeah, I'd love to. So I'm a hybrid adult and pediatric perfusionist at New York Presbyterian Cornell Medical Center in New York City. I graduated with my master's in cardiovascular perfusion sciences from Medical University of South Carolina in the middle of the pandemic in 2020. My first position was at the Mount Sinai Hospital in New York where I learned that my ideal fit is at a high-volume tertiary academic medical center. From the beginning of my perfusion education, my program director, Dave Fitzgerald, was a strong advocate of being a professional, including actively participating in your industry's professional organizations. I took this to heart and became the lead of the student council and student liaison on the board of directors of AMSECT. I peer-reviewed a paper for Jack with Dave and continue to serve on AMSEC's Conference Planning Committee, Bylaws Committee, and International Consortium of Evidence-Based Perfusion. My favorite perfusion experience so far was being invited to give a lecture at the 33rd Annual Saudi Heart Association Conference on Gold-Directed Perfusion. Awesome, Mel. Thank you for sharing. You have amazing experience, that's for sure. And especially participating with the annual Saudi Heart Association, I think that is very admirable. And of course, in episode one, we're going to be interviewing Dave, who is your program director. So we're really excited for that. And as far as my background, I am a pediatric perfusionist and the new supervisor of perfusion at Texas Children's Hospital in Austin, Texas. I earned my master's in medical pharmacology and perfusion sciences in 2012. And since then, I've gained experience at high volume centers like the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota and Children's Hospital Los Angeles. I particularly enjoy a professional memory on a medical mission trip in an underserved region of Brazil with Children's HeartLink Foundation. I found this experience incredibly rewarding to provide much needed care to those in need. I currently participate as a peer reviewer for AMSEC's Journal of Extracorporeal Technology and serve as a member on the editorial board. I write quarterly for the AMSEC Today newsletter, so look out for some interesting reads under the Broken Hearts column, including an upcoming issue on the future of artificial intelligence as it pertains to perfusion. I'm committed to remaining active in the perfusion community through my involvement on AMSEC's ICEBP committee and quality committee. When I'm not at work, you can find me exploring the great outdoors and trying out the newest and weirdest restaurants in Austin. So let's keep it weird, y'all. All right, all right, all right. So Tiff, you're at a party and you get asked, what do you do for a living? Oh gosh, this tends to be a mouthful. So most of the time, I'm quick to define what a perfusionist actually is to avoid that awkward silence of that person thinking in their head, what the heck is a perfusionist? Should I ask or should I know already? Or am I better off just letting her save her breath, which they probably would prefer? Luckily for our listeners, we will take a deep dive into the fascinating world of heart-lung machines and the unsung heroes who operate them, perfusionists. You might be asking what exactly is a perfusionist. If you've ever seen a medical drama where the patient's heart is stopped and a machine takes over to pump blood and oxygen throughout the body, that's the work of a perfusionist. And I have to call out an episode of Grey's Anatomy where a heart transplant was literally being performed without a heart-lung machine or perfusionist in sight. That's Mm. impossible, folks. There is no heart transplant that I know of that does not require the work of a perfusionist. Right, Mel? (laughs) Yes. Now that I got passionately off track, I would like you to think of a perfusionist as a conductor of the body's orchestra, making sure that every organ and tissue gets the right amount of blood flow and oxygen during complex heart surgeries. 
We don't stop there. Perfusionists are responsible for monitoring the patient's blood chemistry, administering medications, and even providing life support during emergencies. So if you're fascinated by the intricate workings of the human body and want to know more about the amazing work that perfusionists do, you've come to the right place. We hope you'll join us on this exciting journey as we explore the world of perfusion. I've seen that episode, actually. (laughs) I love it. I love it. When the bypass circuit runs itself, (laughs) it does not happen. That does not exist. But in all seriousness, working at a high acuity center, I've had interactions with attendings in different subspecialties and getting to know what they do and how our skills and circuits are adapted to help their patients. And it's such a rewarding experience. We can create custom circuits or variations with similar principles and circulate chemotherapy inside the abdomen of patients, provide critical life-saving support to patients in cath lab as a bridge to the operating room, put somebody on ECMO until medications help remodel and restore heart function, help implant permanent devices that take over parts of failing hearts, quickly add components to our circuit that act as dialysis machines, help transplant and protect organs for transplants, perfuse amputated limb for reattachment. Yes, there is a case report on that. Rewarm patients who fall into frozen lakes and arrive in the emergency department deemed dead. The applications continue to grow, and to get to work in this niche is such a unique service line with many rewards and challenges. So what you're saying is we do too much. (laughs) Just kidding. It's No, it, it is such an amazing thing to be a perfusionist and to really have all these responsibilities and challenges ahead of you, but to be trained to do them and carry out those really specified roles. It's really special. So if you're like most people, you may have never heard of this field, but it plays a crucial role. Our goal is to increase awareness of perfusion and bring the stories and expertise of perfusionists to a wider audience. Through our interviews with perfusionists, surgeons, and other medical professionals, we hope to showcase the incredible work that goes on behind the scenes during these high-stakes surgeries. We will also explore the latest research and breakthroughs in the field, as well as the challenges and triumphs that come with working in such a demanding and specialized area in medicine. Yeah, that's such a nice finisher there, like the specialized area, and it's like so demanding. We -hmm. are ancillary staff, but we provide such a unique service. Nobody else really knows what we do, even when you start walking out of that cardiac surgical arena in your own hospital. And it's funny how you can look at a surgeon or a doctor and be like, yeah, like... I can help you with that. Yeah. Put this tube in there. Drain their blood. We'll put it back over there. Just go ahead. Just operate. Your patient's fine. They're supported. Easy. Easy peasy. Yeah. And then I'll go get lunch in an hour. (laughs) But I could just see us. We're sitting here. We're like, yes, we work in high stakes operating arenas. And we do all this work. And and then you have the cardiac fellow at the surgical Mm -hmm. field, like Mm -hmm. staring us down with their loops and laughing at us because their view is like us two people sitting in an OR, hunched in layers of jackets, <laughs> turning a knob like once every 20 minutes. And they're like, yes, you guys work really hard. We're also the only people that sit in the operating room <laughs> for the whole case. Yes. But in all seriousness, there's a lot of ways to have an inside joke about perfusion. But to me, it always seems like a bit of a chess game. You have all these variables and factors to consider when you're on bypass. And then you have a time constraint to make your move. Your tools or the pieces that you're using can move, but they can only move in so many ways. There's always a deficit or a downside to face with every decision that you've made. And you don't always often make moves, but there's a lot of thought and analysis that goes into it. Yeah, that's for sure. We are really diving deep into the brains of perfusionists here. And it's a little scary, but so awesome at the same time. Yeah, I think you're right about the scary part. Sometimes it's not a fun place to be. I feel like perfusion for me has, over the years, become a lifestyle. You always say you want to balance work with your home life. The traits that become ingrained in you as a perfusionist kind of bleed into your life at home, including some of the like weird traits, the perfectionism, the need for putting labels on everything, like your salt shaker or anything home related. I don't know. Help me out here, Mel. I just keep thinking about the expiration date on peanut butter. You have to double check the expiration date before you're, you're peeling open that pack and handing it up. And you start out in the field and you're like, I'm fine. 
I'm totally oh, yeah. normal. And two years in, you know, you're like reading the label on your iced tea at lunch, like meticulously, you yeah. know, exactly how it gets recycled, what's at the bottom of the bottle, and then cycle forward maybe 15 years in the field and suddenly you're losing it. You're taking a Sharpie to your fridge and you're just writing expiration dates on everything. I know. It's like the OCD becomes unreal, but still like in a healthy manner. I think perfusionists know how to have fun, but I do have to add regarding labels. I remember getting my first Keurig coffee maker and I normally just throw out the instruction, but I read you should clean the water dispenser every month. So in seeing that, I was like, this is an IFU for perf perfusion equipment. So I'm about to go to my label maker and make an expiration date for a month to remember to literally clean out that water container of my Keurig. That's where perfusion takes you. And it's beautiful, but also very anal. Um, no, absolutely. I think it serves us well in our profession to be like that. And mm -hmm. it's so hard to turn off. I remember before I got into perfusion school, I was doing an internship at a New York Presbyterian Columbia Center. Spent a year there with their team. So this is pre-perfusion school. Okay, I was there to learn what it was like to be a perfusionist. And mm -hmm. every day there was this comment right around the lines that we're talking about. It's seven in the morning and this guy comes in. And he goes, yeah, I went to a festival over the weekend. It was so much fun. And he goes, like, I'm having a few drinks, like I'm winding down. And then out of nowhere, I start realizing that I'm opening my water bottle with sterile technique. <laughs> I'm putting the cap back on completely yeah. sterilely because I'm so used to doing it with everything in the operating room. And I remember and walking out like, this kid is so weird. Now I am them. That is so true. And then you find yourself laughing on the side about what you just did. Then it becomes like a laugh to yourself because no one else understands. Unless you're hanging out with perfusionists and then they'll just automatically start laughing because they'll be like, I know your struggle, your reality. <laughs> this is why everyone that you ask that has come in contact with us will tell you that perfusionists are some of the weirdest people you will meet. That is no joke. If you feel like you're the odd man out, it's okay. You have a place in perfusion. Like you're going to fit right in. It's totally fine. Mm -hmm. It gets me thinking about some personality traits or <laughs> skill sets that maybe as a kid you have and mm -hmm. you just don't know how you can apply it later on in your life. Like I hear a lot about cardiac surgeons. They'll always tell you how as a child they loved taking things apart. And trying to put it back together. I used to take watches apart. I used to take clocks apart. Anything I could get my hands on that was like a machine. I would love to take it apart and put it back together. And that makes a lot of sense. They're opening up a heart. They're learning the intricacies of the inside of the anatomy of it. Mm -hmm. And then they're creating solutions quite literally out of nothing. and putting it back together to make it work again. So what do you think are like some of those traits that perfusion has? I feel like a lot of perfusionists are just socially awkward. <laughs> it goes away. It's odd, but it goes away. I feel the same way. Like even as a kid, I was always like uncomfortable making friends. Or I didn't know how to start a conversation or talk to people. I was more of like a doer. It's like almost when you learn about child psychology and they talk about yeah. how like little kids play next to each other, but they don't uh -huh. play with each other, you know, and then they start to realize there's another person in their world next to them in the sandbox. And they're like, oh, OK, I maybe we'll interact a little. And I feel like that's how it is. On surgeons do their thing. We do our thing. I'm trying to think back to when I was a child. I don't know if anyone should know the deep things behind Tiffany. I grew up like pretty introverted. You could find me like taking a book from my brother's like little library, like a National Geographic or like reading about spiders or weird things. But I just enjoyed learning. I was born to do things like with a level of like perfectionism. And I blame my dad. He's always like very regimented. Like he would come and swipe like my dresser drawer. And if there was dust on it, he's like, why is this dusty? And not in a mean way. It was just like, you know, I need things clean and nice and regimented like a perfusionist does on pump. Like you have to have a certain level of structure as a perfusionist. Because when things go wrong, you have to be able to think quickly. And sometimes like you don't have time to think about it. You have to do it because it has become a habit for you. I can definitely relate to what you were saying. I was also very introverted as a child, preferring my books to 
trying to make friends, like always feeling really insecure about how to talk to people. And it was definitely a skill I had to learn. And I think that was a positive thing because it's something that you really need as a perfusionist. We're always trying to think ahead Mm -hmm. few steps. We're like in our brains, but we also know how to react to something that we didn't plan. You can't really focus on being social and having conversations when you're in the operating room. You have to be critically thinking. I like that a lot. And I agree. I feel like perfusionists have to be really good at reading patterns. If that makes sense, you got to be able to pick numbers, pick trends. And it's Mm -hmm. like you have to be obsessed with trying to predict a future. And in that obsession of trying to predict a future, you realize how many times in an instant that road splices and changes and turns into something else, depending on what's going on. You have to consistently be adaptable to new situations. That kind of gives us a get out of jail free card from being called control freaks. We're way deep down the hole now, but now we're way in there. It's getting dark. (laughs) You start as a student, you're like, oh, my God, these people are so weird. Like my preceptor. Oh, my God. I moved the syringe two centimeters. What the heck? You know, and then it slowly starts to change, right? Dissections coming in. What are you doing? You're lining up syringes and putting meds in height order. The OCD is Mm -hmm. encroaching. (laughs) You have to be organized. You have to select what things you need to have perfectly lined up. Like you said, Mm -hmm. syringes, medications, even an emergency. You have to take that extra second and say, I know this is heparin. But prioritizing those things is is what's tricky and what makes a good perfusionist versus two seconds behind. We make fun of it, right? And maybe to the person who's not in our shoes, they're like... Oh my God, I'm trusting this person and they're freaking lining up syringes. But it it goes a level deeper to me. I love this comment by someone. They were memeing out various specialties and Mm -hmm. their reactions and the realities of a patient crashing. So you have an ICU attending and they're like, oh my God, the patient is dying. What's (laughs) happening? They're like, I had to go up to 0.75 dopamine and they're yeah. freaking out because the patient's yeah. not doing well. And then you talk about a cardiac surgeon, the patient's dying, call mm-hmm. perfusion, start yeah. CPR, right? And then you have perf- like these odd little people, no one understands us. Then they hear us go, oh my God, something's not right. Things are yeah. literally either about to explode, come off the pump. No, there is a severe impediment to like critical circulation. Yeah. And so in those moments, it's like, I always used to put like my post cross plant medications all Mm -hmm. the way to the right side of the shelf on top of my pump. And it was literally like segregated from other meds. And the reason for it being was like, if I'm going to grab something in a rush, like I do not want to grab two things in 10 cc syringes that look very similar. So those little tweaks, they make a difference in saving a life. I couldn't agree more. Mm-hmm. Like devils in the details. It's such an intricate, beautiful balance that we have to take as perfusionists to keep a patient alive and be our own boss behind the pump. Yeah, it could be beautiful. I hope I'm not painting like this picture of morbid chaos happening every day. It's not like <laughs> oh, that. You painted the picture. <laughs> 99% of the time, it's smooth, it's routine. Yeah. And then like you said, like the devils in the details. One of those things with communication is it's not just what you say. It's about the timing of when you're saying it. It's about the tonality that you're using, the pitch, the frequency. And all of those things come together to convey separate but cohesive messages to a surgeon when they're operating. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad that I was introverted because I spent a lot of time observing other people or I would say things and I would be so insecure that I'd be watching their face for that kind of initial reaction of how they took what I said. Did it go over well? Did it not go over well? Maybe I should have said it differently. So like what you're saying, that structure, that curiosity, that like type A personality is so important. Mm -hmm. Um, And it starts to seep into everything that you're doing exactly for the reasons that you said, right? Because when things go wrong with our stuff, you have seconds to respond. No, you have seconds to formulate what your solution is going to be, what you're going to do, start acting, communicate it. It's a flurry. And for that reason, like, I got to that point in perfusion where, you know, there's an emergency case coming in. What's perfusion doing? And it's like, 
you're lining up syringes on specific <laughs> points of the shelf on your pump. Like heparin goes to the left of yes. my phenylephrine yeah. and it's on the left side of the shelf and it's in the front and the label faces me so I know what it is. And it's yeah. all these like weird things that like if you watched from the outside, you'd be like, what in the heck are they <laughs> doing? There's yeah. an emergency. But you go on pump, it's for a reason, right? If your certain medications always on the right side of your pump, for example, I always put my post cross clamp medications. A lot of people don't know what that means, but you can't give those things at certain times of the surgery. Mm -hmm. Those medications are off to the right side of my pump in a segregated area for a reason specifically that if I have to grab something fast, I'm not accidentally grabbing the wrong one. And yeah. this dosing, the medication and the dose of something that's really important and could be really dangerous. So I think that most perfusionists, they're either like that as children mm -hmm. or <laughs> perfusion makes them that way. And that's exactly why we're doing this podcast, to get to know people in our profession and to also share the word about our profession and how unique it is and get inside the weird minds of perfusionists. I did say earlier, keep it weird, y'all. So I hope you were anticipating <laughs> how weird this got so quickly. <laughs> it rang so true to me when you told me about how you line up your syringes like when you're a perfusionist like you learn how to develop the skill of having a reason for why you do everything and the reason you have a reason is so that you can act quick in dire situations and yeah this sounds very stressful you're probably thinking like why would I ever want to be a perfusionist this is freaking crazy you guys are insane you're nuts but you know what I always think about it is like stress is stress with anything with someone who works and I don't mean to downplay, but like someone who works as a barista, like they have certain stresses serving customers, like sometimes 10 drinks at a time. Who knows? It's a lot or like a bartender or whatever. Um, but like no matter what, like your body goes through stress, stress is stress and you get used to those stressors and you eventually learn how to handle those things one step at a time. <laughs> you have tactics on what to do to make things less stressful for you. So that is like what perfusionists learn over time. So you become like a little bit more desensitized to the actual stress at hand. Our human bodies are experiencing stress in the same ways, I believe. I don't know. I've never done like an active brain scan of different professions that so that would be interesting. But for the most part, I personally believe when people react to me telling them what I do for a living, I'm like, you know what? I am trained to do my job. I do it. Like I have reasons why I do everything. And it's awesome. It's exciting. I love it. I love what you said about working through the stress. And like you said, like everyone experiences stress in a different format. There was actually a really interesting paper that was done. I think they took engineers and they used what's called a, the NASA Task Load Index. I don't know if you've heard of that. But no. so basically the NASA Task Load Index is when engineers decided that they were going to observe astronauts. And they wanted to know what the workflow was, the sequence of the workflow, and how much attention or effort was needed at certain times of their performance. So they took this NASA task load index, right? Task, load, heaviness, and you index it. And they went into a cardiac operating room. Wow. I wish we were doing this as a video because I wish I could just post up this like thing. I did a <laughs> presentation on it oh, wow. on communication. Like when I came out of school for AMSECT and I, I used it as a slide and it was amazing. So you have anesthesia, you have circulating nurse, you have the surgeon, and then you have perfusion on that NASA task load index. And you have patient in the OR up through intubation. And then you have the repair, like the surgery, post bypass, extubation maybe, or leaving the OR. It's like this huge spike for anesthesia when the patient arrives in the room up until the point when you go on bypass and, and then there's dips down real low and it comes back up when we're weaning off bypass. And that makes sense, right? Because we're transitioning care of that patient mm -hmm. with similar functions from the anesthesiologist to the perfusionist and back to the anesthesiologist at those times. The surgeon was really low up until surgery incision. And that makes sense because up until incision, that transition of care hasn't happened to them yet. And then once the surgery was over and the chest was closed, they go back down. 
So anesthesia goes up, surgeon goes down. Perfusion. <laughs> Perfusion's oh, no. line was like from the moment where they start intubating until the chest is really closed and they're undraping the patient, pretty much the end of surgery. Perfusion's task load index was at an all-time high consistently throughout the entire thing. And wow. I think that just goes to show what we're talking about in terms of stress, attention to detail, learning how to work through that stress calmly, like not feeling it as much. Your body is undergoing a stressor, but you develop these routines, you develop these habits, you develop this ability to scan the room and look for certain details in every situation to keep yourself calm and anticipate yeah. what might be happening. But I thought it was absolutely fascinating that they put that in the OR. That is fascinating. I'm really happy that you painted that picture. We don't get enough credit, but we're not like the type of crew that like wants the credit. And I don't mean to just have a certain bias. Like a lot of perfusionists are introverts. They're just weird. We don't we don't need to be recognized, but there is definitely some amazing, unique skills that a perfusion must know and must know really well to perform their job well. So I think at the end of the day, it's just a rewarding experience to be a perfusionist. And despite the stress, we have all these tasks that we accomplish every single day. And by the end of the day, we're helping to save a life. So that's the beautiful thing that we go home and we think about. So, Yeah, this is such a big thing. Like the way we might talk about perfusion sometimes may come off sounding like it's this really stressful profession. And the disclaimer is we have a tremendous responsibility in the operating room. And the fact that the doctors, patients, everyone in there trusts us enough and hand over their care to us the way that they do, it's an unbelievable privilege, to be honest. And I think that the one thing that makes like the perfusion industry or that profession like so beautiful and so rewarding and so enjoyable is that despite the mountain of responsibility that you're being handed, when you walk into that operating room and you have this ironclad routine and you show up and you do the same three initial steps, you plug in your stuff on the wall, you turn that pump on, you hear the machine sound awakening, and I don't know, you just settle things just make sense. You stop hearing everything around. So therapeutic. You start tracing the lines on your circuit. You start tightening all these connections. And I don't know, it's so beautiful. I like, you know, just love it. I just love it. And by the time you're ready to go on bypass, you're like, you're zen. You're totally zen. And you have a sense of confidence that can't be taken away from you because it's the kind of confidence you only get when you have a 100% belief and know that you've done everything you've had to do to make this go smoothly. And that's the kind of confidence that is an energy. You're calm, you're moving slow but smooth, and everyone else in the OR can feel that. They can sense that. And it, like it starts to click on your team and things just start running together. It's really great. It's it is a beautiful dance from like start to finish. I think that was like better than I could have said it. Now, if I wasn't a perfusionist right now, I would definitely want to become a perfusionist <laughs> like ASAP. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah. people out there who are studying for med school, like scratch that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I saw a TikTok today. My coworker sent it to me and he was like, they're on to us like our cover is blown and I open the video it's like this healthcare professional and they were like yeah so how much debt are you in and the guy was like yeah $350,000 like how much do you have left now he's like 90000 he's like how much do you make and he's like I'm not telling you that well, and then that the best one. part was is he goes I'm not going to tell you that but I will tell you one thing go be a perfusionist it all makes sense they live very comfortably <laughs> I died Oh, my God. We got to interview that guy. <laughs> Get him yeah. on here. In summary, Mel and I connected because we have an insatiable hunger for 
learning from experts in the field, and for growing as professionals. We want to build this community and ignite a thrill among young and old perfusionists and healthcare workers to want to know more. We want to encourage adaptability in an evolving field of medicine. Much like a pump, the world keeps turning and we have to dance along with it. A beautiful dance. As perfusionists, we are expert anticipators. We want to bring the practice here to our podcast to promote professional progress and keep the big picture in mind. Most importantly, we want to inspire fun. Our jobs can be quite serious, as we discussed, but we want to be your morning coffee and your evening fireside chat. We are here to sprinkle education on your favorite warm and comforting latte. So let's get pumped and flow together. This is not a yoga session, though. Disclaimer. Oh, wait, it's not. <laughs> it's not a yoga podcast. Okay. No, no. I wish it was, though. <laughs> Might be a wine podcast, though, shortly. I know. I'm feeling it now. <laughs> That's a wrap for this episode. <clears throat> We're your source for all things perfusion. We really want to thank you for tuning in and taking time to learn with us. We hope that the episode was informative and enlightening. If you have any questions, comments, or topics you'd like us to cover, please send us an email at pumpcasters at gmail.com. Don't forget to subscribe so that you never miss an episode. Until next time, keep the blood flowing, keep an eye on your level, from the latest techniques to the biggest challenges and trends, we cover it all on Pump, the perfusion podcast that never misses a beat.